Well, good morning. It is just wonderful to be here with you in Oklahoma. Um, I am on the steering committee for Christ at the Checkpoint in Bethlehem, and uh, we have discussed this gathering here and are so excited that you folks in Oklahoma have been willing and uh, eager uh, to step up and uh, host something here in the United States. One of the things that we want to do at our, uh, our conference is to lay a biblical foundation. Because this conversation that we have about Christian Zionism and about all of the controversies that swirl around Israel and Palestine, Palestine, they're not just political controversies, and you're going to hear a lot about the political sort of tensions inside of the country soon enough. But they're also theological tensions because <clears throat> those people who are using the Bible want to weigh in on this discussion. They want to weigh in on this controversy with the scriptures in one hand saying, this is how you carry the Bible into this debate. Have any of you, are you surprised by that, seriously? <laughs> no, in fact, I have a friend in the Middle East who has said to me, the truth is the Bible has been weaponized in this controversy. That's a really sad thing to hear, isn't it? So one of the things we need to do <clears throat> is we need to lay a firm, a strong foundation so that you and I have an idea of what central themes in scriptures will help us inform this conversation and inform it well. It is easy to be irresponsible in the use of the Bible in this situation. Now that shouldn't surprise us either because the Bible has been so misused in almost every generation and in a long list of political conflicts around the world. There I mentioned the Puritans. So therefore, when it comes to things like, uh, like the Middle East and Israel-Palestine, you and I want to take up the Bible because I believe that what we have inside of our scriptures is one of the great secrets which will really help us understand how to stand in this issue rightly. So if you don't actually know what those secrets are, if you don't hold the keys in the correct manner, you're not going to be able to open those doors. So what I would like to do is I'd like to begin this morning by talking about what is a very important passage in the New Testament. It's in Luke chapter 4. You know, every gospel writer had uh, an interesting set of problems in front of them. Imagine Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, at the desk, perhaps. Imagine a desk if they didn't have desks, but that doesn't matter really. But imagine on the desk, they have all kinds of stories about Jesus. How do you launch the story of the public ministry of Jesus? They know they have to contain this story. It can't go on forever. And so therefore, they have to be selective. They need to build this story accurately and responsibly, but also they want to build it dramatically. Because you see, this, these stories that we have inside of the Gospels were probably used in oral presentation, not the way you and I read them today. So they had to ask, how do you raise the curtain on the public ministry of Jesus? How do you open this story with all of its complexity? You need a prelude. You need an opening scene. You need something that is going to set the tone. You have to have some, some snapshot that really does encapsulate the entire story, to establish the characters, to set up the problem, to create tension if it needs to be created. You have to show where the threats are because your hero, Jesus, is about to walk onto the stage in your story, and in the end of the story, he's going to be crucified. Well, that's an interesting problem. Hero steps onto the stage, ends up getting killed. How did that happen? All the gospel writers know about this. So therefore, how can you encapsulate that story? Raise the curtain so that your reader is going to get it. It's like an overture to a symphony. It's like foreshadowing in a play. The great prelude has got to be like a rocket that launches the entire thing. Now, when you open the Gospels and you look at, say, for instance, the Gospel of Mark, Mark has decided how he's going to launch his story. <clears throat> he launches his story based on the idea of fear. The people living in the ancient world had a lot to be afraid of. They had a really well, enormous idea about demons and skin diseases and illnesses, all kinds of things. And so therefore, Mark has you walking through episodes where Jesus defeats those things that will scare you. Nice. I like that, Mark. Way to go. Matthew looks at this and he says, yeah, okay, I, Mark, yeah, that was fine, but that's not going to be my approach. 
Mark decide, Matthew decides that he's going to launch with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. For Matthew, it's the great curtain raiser. So therefore, Jesus reminds me of Moses going up onto a mountain and delivering the essence of what he wants to teach. John's gospel launches with the wedding at Cana, a very symbolic event inside of first century Judaism that represents the greatest banquet you would ever have and therefore became in Judaism the symbol of the Messiah's arrival. So therefore, Luke, of course, wants to best all of his friends. He knows a story. He knows a story that Matthew did not use, that Mark did not use, that John did not use. He knows a story that comes out of Nazareth. It is a small drama that sets the stage. It is a little story that is going to foreshadow everything that's going to happen inside of the gospel. It tells the entire story in just a couple of paragraphs. And it is poetry as well. Now, if you look at this, I need to teach you something about how people in the ancient Hebrew world uh, like to do storytelling. You know, whenever you're in a culture that is highly illiterate, um, you have to have very sh keen skills, rhetorical skills. And so therefore, they love to use what was called mirroring in the ancient world. Mirroring means this. If I tell you a story, um, I begin telling you a narrative that goes A, B, C, and then I wind it back. C, B, A. See how that goes? And so therefore, the two sides of the story actually mirror one another, and it's easy to memorize. So we have evidence of this going all the way back into the Hebrew prophets, and the New Testament is filled with these things as well. So therefore, as you look at this first passage, notice it, Paul, or Luke introduces the public ministry of Jesus. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report went through the whole neighborhood about him, and he taught in their synagogues. Now, synagogue I put in red because whenever you have a mirroring structure, what happens is you put that emphasis right there at that turning point. You know, in Western storytelling, what happens is we like to tell a story, think of your favorite movie, where you launch your characters, story, 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 and then at the end, you get the punchline. Isn't that the way we like to tell stories? That's the way we work. But in the ancient world, it was very artful to tell a story like this. So the key idea is at the center point. He taught in their synagogues, and he was praised by all. Now, do you see how green, praised by all, matches the report going out? See how that mirrors itself? And he came to Nazareth, which happens to be a village in Galilee, where he had been brought up. All right. So therefore, we know, Luke is letting you know, he knows after Jesus' baptism, he does return to Galilee, and his fame spread rapidly. The power of the Spirit is upon him. He's doing miracles and exorcisms. He's teaching in synagogues. He is a well-established teacher by this time. But this is all Luke gives you, a couple of sentences. That's all about that prelude to his ministry. Jesus has enormous popular support. A few words later, a few sentences later, we're going to find out that Jesus is astonishing the crowds. They're very impressed at what he is saying. When you find in the Gospels people saying, people are astonished at what he is saying, this is a phrase that is not referring, in the ancient world anyway, to Jesus being a gifted speaker. No, no. When we today say, oh, everybody was astonished at what he said, what we imply by that is somebody sort of commanded the audience and the microphone and moved the room. You ever heard that phrase before? It's horrible. No, 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 no. No, but when you have that phrase 2,000 years ago, it means he is saying things that set us back on our heels. He is saying things which we didn't expect him to say. He is saying controversial things. He's talking about God's grace and generosity and the nature of the world in a way no one else talks. He is unpredictable. He is unexpected. So Jesus decides to go back to his hometown in Nazareth. Now, of course, those of you who have been to the Middle East, uh, I know many of you have, you would know already where Nazareth is located. It is in the lower area. We call it Lower Galilee. There I've got Capernaum on the map. So he goes to Nazareth, and when he's in Nazareth, he visits his home synagogue. Now, we know, by the way, that Jesus bases his ministry in Capernaum. He doesn't base it in Nazareth. Nazareth was a very tiny town. 
It was really kind of remote. It was in the mountains of Lower Galilee. No, he wants to base his ministry in Capernaum. So he is really here for a visit. It was probably Thanksgiving or something. Now, look what happens when we, he gets there. Now, you can see the first mirroring. I've already put it on the screen there so you can see it once again. But now we have perhaps one of the most artful storytelling forms that we have anywhere in the Gospels. Watch it closely. So Jesus entered, as was his custom, into the synagogue of Nazareth. All right, so fine. He's in the synagogue. I put that in red for you. He stood up to read. Nice. They gave him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Opening the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim to the prisoners freedom and to the blind recovery of sight. Now, you remember what I told you about mirroring. When you turn that corner, that's where your point of emphasis is. You always want to keep your eye on it. So I have underlined this. To the blind recovery of sight. And to send for the oppressed ones in freedom. Uh-huh, yes. Oppressed ones. Take a look at seven. Now jump up earlier in orange. Do you see the prisoners? Of course you do. And to proclaim, that's six prime, and now go up to six, preaching. Oh, yes, it's a mirror. The acceptable year of the Lord. Yes, this is the year in which the Messiah will come. And Isaiah 61, quoted in number five above, that's exactly what the year of the Lord is. He closes the book. Earlier, what did he do in number four? He opened the book. He gave it back to the attendant. Above in three, what do you have? He gave, the, the book was given to him. He sat down, two prime, go up to two. What do you have? He stood up. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Interesting. All right, now notice in one and one prime that this se section, this beautiful bit of poetry, is actually bookended by one word in red. What is it? Synagogue, exactly. And if you look at the turning point, you can see that the emphasis is the blind who do not have sight and they want that recovered. And so therefore, it's easy for me to reconstruct this a little bit. I can see that synagogue is weaving these two paragraphs together really nicely, synagogues and synagogues. And I can see that blindness is at the very heart of this entire structure. So therefore, if it's true, that this thing is really discussing what it means to be blind, then I am wondering if this very last line, and Jonah, I'm not getting my transitions up here. You would do the next transition for me. Um, the very, there we go. So therefore, if I have at the turning point a conversation about sight, is it any surprise that I have now a conversation about eyes at the very end of the structure? Do you see how this is working? This is an artfully presented teaching to us that is structurally ancient, but it is carrying the very essence of what Jesus wants to teach. Now, I think that we then want to keep our eye on who is going to be blind and who is going to have their sight recovered and whose eyes are we talking about. Now, if you'd like to know what kind of setup this is when Jesus is doing all this, I threw this in just for fun the other day. So this is the best reconstruction of a first century synagogue in the entire country. Next time you are in Israel, Palestine, what you need to go is when you're at Capernaum, just simply tell the driver you want to go up on the road to the Golan Heights. And within 10 minutes, you'll be at this lovely archaeological park. This is Gamla, frozen in time from AD 70. So therefore, Jesus is in a setting where everyone is sitting around him on the outer edge. He is standing in the midst of a crowd where there is conversation going on. All right, so what do we have here? What Jesus has done is the controversial thing. What Jesus has done is the controversial thing. Isaiah 61, which he has quoted, the scroll of Isaiah is handed to him inside of the synagogue. He turns the scroll to Isaiah 61. It had been used for the Messiah for centuries. Everyone recognizes the quote that he gives. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
It promises that Israel would be blessed and renewed. You need to go back to Isaiah 61 and see the entire context of that chapter. Somehow Isaiah 61 had become the song of Israel's national privileges. God's spirit would come back upon the nation and there would be a reversal of national fortune. Those people who were privileged to rebuild Jerusalem and enjoy all of the fruit of their labor, this is what would happen. And so therefore, what Jesus does, catch this. Everyone thinks he's just quoting Isaiah 61, but he's not. So he's in Isaiah 61. He reads the opening verses. Everyone would recognize it. And then he stops. He begins working the scroll back to chapter 42. Then he moves the scroll forward to 40, 58. And what Jesus is doing is creating a composite quote. Really? He's taking Isaiah 61 and inserting into it chapters 42 and 58 in order to, do, to create a mosaic, a patchwork. In other words, Jesus wants to say, that the notion of messianic blessing, when the Messiah arrives, it will not be in order to establish the national blessing of this country. It is going to be there to take care of the poor and the blind and the prisoners. What a scandalous idea. In other words, the receivers of God's grace are not those who pursue national privileges. The receivers of God's grace are going to be those who live on the margin. Now, you and I miss this. But it's like, it's, it's like Jesus standing up in front of us and saying, let's say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the... And then halfway in, he starts doing his own thing. Do you think that would be scandalous? <laughs> oh, yeah. We would know that Pledge of Allegiance so well. They knew Isaiah 61 so well. And Jesus is doing a flying edit of the most sacred text anyone in the room knew. So the Messiah will bless not a few, not one nation, one race, one culture. The Messiah is going to bless everyone. Now, the main themes of Isaiah 61 are missing here in Jesus' quote. And it's what Jesus doesn't say that sets them all back on their heels. Now, that's amazing. Now, so of course, you get to the very center of this story, as you folks have seen, and every eye in the synagogue is on him. The question in the story is, who is blind and who isn't blind? This is where Jesus has inserted Isaiah 42, verse 7, right into that favorite passage. And he says, you know what really is at stake here is making sure you can see God's word rightly. Isaiah 42, 7, stuck into Isaiah 60, 61. What a thing to do. The crowd knows it. I'm sure the crowd is electrified. Jesus closes the scroll of Isaiah, and the eyes of the entire room are fixed on him. They are staring at him, and of course we wonder, are these the eyes that are blind. Do you see the irony of the whole thing? Everybody is staring at him, but Jesus has come to cure blindness. Well, who's blind in the room? It's everyone in his audience. But they still want to make nice. They do. So Jesus began to say to them, oh, today, you know, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Oh my goodness, you're messing with Isaiah 61 and you're saying it's been fulfilled. Are you saying that you're Messiah? At this point, a lot of pastors and interpreters think that the reason Jesus gets in trouble in this synagogue is because he just claimed that he was the Messiah. Something couldn't be further from the truth. That's not it at all. Because look at the next verse. Everyone spoke well of him, and they wondered at the gracious words that came out of his mouth, and they said, is not this Joseph's son? You should know that 2,000 years ago, whenever you wanted to say an honoring title for a man, you would say, you would refer to his father. Is this not Joseph's son? That's an honorary thing to say. He grew up in Nazareth. We knew him as a little boy. He rode his bike on our streets. 
Whenever you hear someone say to Jesus, is this not the son of Mary? That's dishonoring. In this world, you do not say something like this. So they're making nice. And then Jesus said, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here also in your own country. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own country. So Jesus is now saying, look, I know what you want. I have just made clear my identity as the Messiah. And now you are going to ask me to do what I did in Capernaum. Demonstrate it, prove it by doing one of the miracles you are so famous for. And Jesus says, you know, when you come to your own town, people just really don't want to hear you. So therefore, Jesus has to drop two bombs. Two bombs in Nazareth. Number one. In truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. Now, this is nice poetry as well. The heavens were shut up for three years and six months. There came a great famine over the entire land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the city of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Now, you and I may not understand exactly why those bombs have just detonated. I'll show you how. This is why, in the next verse, look at their reaction. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was what? It isn't that he quoted Isaiah 61 and announced that this is being fulfilled and that he's the Messiah. That's not what sets them off. What sets them off is what Jesus just said right here. They rose up, put him out of the city, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down headlong. But passing through the midst of them, he went away. End of story. Oh my gosh. Jesus has just launched his public ministry. This is why Luke loves the story. Launched his public ministry read one of the most sacred texts in all of the synagogues, announced that it has just been fulfilled, he feels the pushback coming from them, and then announces two of the most provocative stories he can find right out of the Old Testament, and they try to kill him for it. Nice. So Luke is saying to us, when you really figure out what Jesus is up to in his ministry, you'll want to throw him off a cliff. All right, so therefore, we have got to go back and ask ourselves, all right, so why were these bombs and what was the reaction? If I tried to reconstruct, say, the mental map of Jews who were living in the first century, if you tried to reconstruct that, as you can construct a mental map, say, for how you and I think about America, you know, somebody who doesn't live in America would not realize that we've got two huge oceans on both sides of us, the Atlantic and the Caribbean. So anyway, <laughs> see, all of you got the joke because you know, right? Anyway, you can do insider, that was an insider joke. But we get that because we know our geography. We know what it means, the difference between the North and the South. And when I came here yesterday, I asked somebody who is from Oklahoma, I said, am I in the North or the South? It was so fun, I was at the airport. And, I, and he goes, uh, not sure. <laughs> that was really fun because you'd have to know something about American geography. On my mental map of America, you've got the North and the South, and I don't know where Oklahoma falls out on that. Do you know what I mean? So we all have mental maps. What was the mental map like for those people who were living in this world? So therefore, you can see, I've got a picture here of Galilee. You can see Nazareth on my map. But there is this other area up in the north called Phoenicia. That is not in Israel. In fact, there is Syria. And you can see I've placed Elisha and Elijah's name on the map because they, Jesus is actually telling a story about how he is going to go beyond a certain boundary. In fact, let me improve my map if I can. So therefore, as they began to, Joni, you're going to have to hit that again. So therefore, if you imagined the map, the mental map, most Jews living up in Galilee or in all of Judea, they had sort of a metaphorical wall. That seems so ironic in our day. They had a metaphorical wall they might have built. And there are those people who live north of that wall, and there are people who live south of that wall. 
In other words, those people who are God's people live south of this wall, and those people who live north are Gentiles. And therefore, when you say words like Phoenicia or Sidon or Tyre, when you say words like Syria, that's fairly provocative. And so therefore, Jesus says, well, the essence of what I am about as Messiah will be to imitate the work of Elijah and Elisha. And by the way, guess where they went? They went over the wall. They went all the way to Sidon, all the way to Syria, because they wanted to pass God's blessing to this place, this environment. In order to do that, if you go back and read the stories of Elijah and Elisha, they needed to bypass Israel because Israel was unresponsive to God's voice in the prophets. So therefore, we can imagine why is it that these people are so angry? They're angry because Jesus is talking about the generosity of God. In Jesus' day, these Gentiles north of the wall are repugnant. They are foreigners. They've got the wrong religion, the wrong culture, the wrong language, the wrong music. They've got the wrong everything. We have accounts from this period of time where Jewish armies actually went into areas like this over to the east more and actually just said, we've got to purify these areas and get rid of every Gentile we can. God certainly doesn't love outsiders would have been their assumption. But Jesus is claiming the opposite. Notice that Elijah, he says, and Elijah blessed the foreigner. Elijah and Elisha wanted to bless those who live on the margin. No wonder they want to kill him. No wonder they want to toss him off the cliffs of Nazareth. This is not something you would expect anyone to say if they had just arrived and said, well, I'm the Messiah. By the way, I brought with me a photograph, a picture of um, what the cliffs of Nazareth look like. Yeah, uh, it's up to you, Jenna. We're going to be going. Nope, go back one. Anyway, I thought you'd like to see that. This is where you're supposed to ooh and awe, by the way. Thank you very much. It was a necessary ooh and awe. That's a good picture, you have to say, right? So Nazareth is up in the mountains of southern Galilee, and it's built in kind of a bowl. But if you go to the edge of that bowl and you just go to the east side of it, you're going to see a cliff like this. So they try to throw him off. And what's implied in that is he's going to be stoned as well. Rocks follow your fall. So Jesus escapes into the, the chaos. He moves from Nazareth down to Capernaum. And he is called Jesus of Nazareth because you never lose the name of your village home. He's always Jesus of Nazareth, just like Paul is always known as Paul of Tarsus. Yeah, even though Paul's life took him way outside of Tarsus. Jesus will always be Jesus of Nazareth, but he's going to move to Capernaum. All right, so this is for Luke, the great curtain raiser. The Messiah is on the scene. It is Jesus. Jesus is using one of our favorite stories, but it's shocking what he does with it. Who has the right to fiddle with something so sacred? And you know what he's doing with it makes me so angry. I might just want to kill him for it. Now, I've spoken in a lot of venues. I've never had the crowd do that to me, and I hope here in Oklahoma I'm going to head home safely. But for Jesus, this is a shocking experience. There is a great rabbi um, who was in the 19th century called Rabbi Israel Salantes. Uh, he was a Lithuanian, and there's a quote that rabbis today love to quote, and I think I, I love it too. It's a great quote. Your rabbi is only your rabbi when you want to run him out of town. It's a great one. Think about your pastor that way. If he's just placating everybody in the church, he really is not your pastor. Your pastor only becomes your pastor when you want to throw him off a cliff. In other words, that pastor, that rabbi needs to have that prophetic voice. So therefore, in this story, Jesus qualifies. If you don't feel the sharp edge of Jesus' teaching here, if you don't feel just a little uncomfortable with the story you just heard, Jesus is not your rabbi. The problem with us is that we have domesticated this story, we have sanitized this story, and because we are cultural foreigners to this story, we don't feel the edge. 
Jesus is using his prophetic voice and it nearly got him killed. See, Isaiah had been used for centuries to say, God wants to prosper our poor nation. Jesus is saying, no, God wants to prosper the poor. Isaiah had been used for centuries to say, God wants to bless our citizens. Jesus says, no, God likes to bless foreigners, even Syrians, Lord have mercy. Isaiah had promised to give the blind sight. Hmm. Jesus implies the blind are packed into this synagogue in front of me. Oh my goodness. In this great opening scene, Luke wants us to see how dangerous this gospel really is. It is genuinely about the poor, genuinely about the prisoner, the blind, the outcast, the foreigner, the widow, and the destitute. It is about those who are living on the margins and those who want to accumulate power and wealth and land for themselves. No, they have missed the message and they are blind. The good news is that God has grace for those who live where you least expect it. So the question that we want to then just leave ourselves with, Jonah, is, all right, so what really makes these guys mad? What is the deepest problem that these synagogue members have? Why are they so angry? How could they get triggered like that? It's crazy. I mean, very few audiences will rise up and try to kill their speaker. Are you kidding me? Here's the essence of it. Jesus is upending the geographical and ethnic priorities of Judaism. Take that to the bank. Jesus is upending the geographical and ethnic priorities of Judaism. His ministry, the dawn of the Messianic age, means that some things are going to shift. And when they shift, it's going to make you mightily uncomfortable. God's new plan is going to include Syrians and Phoenicians. It's going to include people you don't expect at all. Maybe even one or two Palestinians, but not any more than that. The real problem is that Jesus' own people just can't see it. They are blind to the fact that this new messianic era is going to open a new chapter and walk through a new door. And, and until they embrace God's new plan, the blessing of God will bypass them. So therefore, what I have inside of the gospel are two ideas, two fundamental ideas that tomorrow morning and the morning after I want to explore with you. Jesus' kingdom will shift common ideas about race and geography. That's what we're going to explore for the next two, Sunday, uh, next two days. Jesus' kingdom will shift common ideas about race and geography. Now, I'm sure that people wanted to debate with Jesus. I imagine when he finished this sermon, I don't have any doubt there was a roaring debate that erupted at that moment. There were those who wanted to say, wait, 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 our tribe is exceptional. Our land is ours alone. You see, this is the location where God works, and we are the people among whom he works. Do you ever think words like those have been uttered throughout human history? Of course, it always happens. When the plain teaching of Scripture is found, when the new plan of God is uh, presented, it doesn't fit the agenda or the theology that is commonplace in the country. There are national mythologies that always arise in every country. Um, we just moved about a year ago to Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was at Wheaton College for 25 years, and now I'm at Calvin Seminary. It's a great place. Love West Michigan. I was at the Grand Rapids Museum with my grandchildren. I had such a grandfathery thing to do. And they had this whole exhibit on World War I and World War II military uniforms. 
Okay, why not? I was in the Navy once a hundred years ago, so I thought, I'd like to see that stuff. So I'm standing there, and they had a whole section on posters that were published during the war. And there was this World War I poster that really caught my attention. It showed this guy in an army uniform, rifle and bayonet, and it said across the top, this was one of the most popular out there, he has done his part at the bottom because God is on his side. Praise the Lord. Every military, every nation, every ethnicity, every tribe, every land creates these national mythologies that somehow we have God. And when someone comes along and begins to upend or question that national mythology, you get angry. Which is why, if you listen very carefully, you will hear some anger attached to a little gathering called Christ at the checkpoint. See, because what Christ at the checkpoint is touching on is the possibility that there is a national mythology at work inside of the Middle East. And when you touch that thing, people will get mad. See, there's a great quote somebody gave to me the other day. They said, when entitled people lose some of their privileges, they experience it as oppression. Actually, that came from the Me Too movement. I'll say it again. When entitled people begin to feel that they are losing some of their, uh, their privileges, they experience that loss as oppression. So in other words, when Jesus begins to upend things that seem to be so sacred to me, we would rather toss him off a cliff than invite any of these changes into the room, which may just describe a few of my evangelical friends and some of my Christian Zionist friends. They can't see the change. They can't see what Jesus is doing that is new, and that makes Jesus intolerable. So therefore, we are going to see that there are some enormous ideas. There's an upheaval at work, because what we are going to discover in the next two days is that the scriptures tell us, challenge this sense of ethnic exceptionalism. In other words, is it true that all people are loved by God, no matter what tribe they belong to? Is that true? Are there some people who are so positioned in their own religious world that they have a kind of religious entitlement? Well, personally, I know God loves Presbyterians more than all of the Methodists in my world. I'm Presbyterian. But you know, you get those thinking, don't you? That somehow I have a kind of religious entitlement, and what that pours into is national privilege. That in some manner, I belong to a nation, or the Middle East has a nation, or somewhere in the world there's a nation that God smiles on in a way that he doesn't smile on other nations. The New Testament is going to upend these ideas, these two major ideas of race and geography, and both are controversial. You touch race or geography, and the room blows up. Christian Zionism is a religious nationalism, I believe, that misunderstands the gospel. Christian Zionism is the embodiment of the distortion of the gospel. And many of my theologian friends that I have known for a long time have begun now to talk like this about it. You know, when you're living in the context of a controversial teaching, you never recognize really how wrong it is. And probably in 75 years or 100 years, our grandchildren will look back on this era and they will say, what was anyone thinking? And they will probably describe this as one of the greatest distortions of the gospel we've ever seen. But if we follow Jesus, he is going to lead us into new territory. And that new territory is going to, is going to bless the foreigner. It is going to uh, protect the oppressed. And it is going to deny those who think they are privileged. And it has to be expected. When you touch those privileges, 
you are going to make people unhappy. Amen? Amen. This week, my hope for all of you who are attending a thing like this for the first time are not only going to be deepened in your understanding of this new course the scriptures are charting, but also you're going to understand the context of the Middle East and its tensions in a way you never have before. And I hope when you emerge out of these three days, you're going to say to yourself, I think I want to be a true follower of Jesus, following him beyond the frontiers of what's expected and have a new way to see things in the Middle East. Let's begin our morning with prayer, shall we? <clears throat> Lord God, we do ask that you would be with each of us as we study and learn and grow in these three days. Lord, bless us, we ask. Heal our blind eyes where it is needed. Help us to see the new thing that you wanted to begin. Give us courage and resolve. Teach us how to be faithful in new ways. And all of God's people said,